Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. For the Women in Leadership series, we have with us today Lucy Newcomb, a seasoned business leader and the CEO of the Newcomb Global Group Incorporated. With nearly three decades of experience, Lucy is a recognized pioneer in global marketing, sales, and business development. So let's go and talk to Lucy. Hi, Lucy. How are you? Hi, Emra. I'm fine. Thank you. Greetings from Silicon Valley. How's your day? My day was good. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, Lucy, I'm going to start out by asking you about your story, your your journey, and how you became a CEO and founder of Newcom Global Group, and what uh, what does your company do? Thanks, Amra. What a pleasure. Um, so, let's start with what we do, and then we'll talk about my journey, which um, is a little bit hilarious, and also, you know, I'm so grateful for it. Um, so, the Newcom Global Group, which I'm honored to have founded and lead. Uh, is an international management consulting firm. And we help business to business companies, in other words, companies that sell to other businesses, go global or in the last few years, stay global, given the challenges we've had. And we also specialize in global leadership development. We see that as one long pipeline of how to get overseas and how to build market leadership, and then how to stay there and lead are two different things. So I'm very honored to be doing that. And uh, we specialize, by the way, in technology. You might not be surprised, based in Silicon Valley and services sectors. And I'm also pleased to have worked in emerging markets quite a bit, although not in Pakistan just yet. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so my journey, <laughs> I'm laughing because I am an accidental entrepreneur. I have had the honor of training hundreds of entrepreneurs around the world for groups like the U.S. State Department, the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development, and I did all the things I trained people not to do. <laughs> I had no, <laughs> I had no plan. I had no budget. I actually had no intention. Um, I had been headhunted. I still have my neck. I had been headhunted to go overseas to South Africa at the end of apartheid, and um, as Nelson Mandela was coming into power, so we're opening up again the global markets for the country because you may recall that apartheid meant no one could do business with them and they couldn't do business with any of us. Right. So I had the honor of going to help a textile company come back into global markets. And I was supposed to be gone two months. I was gone five years. <laughs> and wow. <laughs> during, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm very honored. It was an amazing experience. And um, I, I know we have limited time, so just to, sh to focus on your particular question. Um, so in order to stay with immigration issues, which, you know, are only fair, um, I had to found my own company really fast <laughs> because the opportunities I saw to help people, you know, 40 years of being cut off from exports is one thing, and that's really hard. But to be cut off from management thinking and progress is even harder. So I saw there was a real opportunity to help people get back into a competitive mindset because when you're in a closed marketplace, you know, you either buy towels from company A or company B. That's right. it. And right. th there's a complacency that comes with that. So I was able to um, bring some skills forward and work with White House officials and large companies like IBM, Johnson & Johnson, and as well as many startups uh, very quickly. So that is, in a nutshell, how I started. I learned quickly. I was fortunate to do very well. And then I came back here to Silicon Valley. I'm actually from the Bay Area, right. and which is the same same region. And um, that's how it started. And I've built a much more disciplined approach since then. <laughs> All right. Very nice. Very nice, Lucy. So, um, Lucy, I just want to know, uh, women CEOs run 10.4% 10 of Fortune 500 companies today. Uh, the number was 3.8% in 2014. So as we can see, it's uh, increased the number of women CEOs, but it's still very low. So so what do you, why do you think that is? That's an interesting question. Well, I see that, um, I'm a visual thinker, so I sort of see that as a matrix in two ways. Um, first of all, this is an issue for women well beyond the CEO seat, unfortunately. It's a very much an issue for women uh, founders like myself. 
who um, instead of what I do, which is to run a professional services firm, who run uh, startups, technology startups, the venture funding for women here in the U.S., where it all began, startup scene, mm-hmm. um, is around 2%. It's just appalling. So um, this, I'm not dodging your question. I'm saying it's a pervasive problem. And we have to, in my view, which as a systems thinker is not surprising, is that we have to look at it in a big picture kind of way. Tackle it area by area. But what is the overall issue that we're addressing? And the second thing I'll say about that is it's not just women, right? It's mm-hmm. people of color. It's anyone who is not in the cookie cutter mold that has been successful right. <laughs> here. So um, again, we have this sort of horizontal women across spheres issue. And then we have this vertical of underrepresented people in general are challenged. And the, the good news about that is, A, a lot of us are working on it. Um, I, I realize that there's plenty of room for complaint and certainly I've had mine and I privately still do, but I think the time is really, how are we going to move forward? It's clear it's not okay. We can talk about that forever, or we can try to come up with solutions together, as you have said. So, um, one of the things is, and it seems obvious, but it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem is to get more women in higher positions because as we all know, and the seat of this problem is people like hires like (laughs) so the more women we have in power seats then the chances are better you know that qualified women not right not handouts qualified women because also um well i'll finish the sentence qualified women hiring qualified women have enormous benefit um not just in the immediate circumstance but for ages to come and we know from the data that diverse teams whether it's leadership boards executives deliver better results. We've seen it in the data now, which is so helpful because there was a time when it sort of came off as a nice thing to do and maybe an interesting thing to do. Now it's a data-driven reason to do. So, right. you know, shareholders are accountable, stakeholders are accountable. So I'm giving you very sweeping issues because I think at response, because I think these are sweeping issues. They are, yeah. That said, that said, I think we have to have strategic plans that are very tactical. So organizations like Chief that um, I've been privileged to be a member of in the past, plenty of other organizations. Um, I'm involved in Women in the Boardroom. We'll talk more about that later. Um, All of these organizations that help to empower women. And, you know, the challenge also is now how to work with other women because a lot of us are competing for very small number of seats, right? Right. So that's that's another conversation altogether. But um, it's a multifaceted issue, and I think we have to tackle it bit by bit. So let's see the whole problem, and then let's create scenarios in which we are, okay, so we know all of the sky that exists. Let's do these clouds today, these clouds tomorrow. Oh, we can't move these clouds until we've moved these. So, And as we all start to open more doors for one another, some of that is sort of the abundance versus scarcity mentality, yeah. um, then more and more doors will open. You know, right now here in the Valley, it's especially hard because we've lost over 200,000 worldwide, 200,000 tech jobs in the last few months. Right. You know, it's a lot easier to have an abundance mentality when there are more things to go around. So True. I think women, we just have to stay strong and tough. And uh, we'll talk more about women's empowerment, but I think it's a really important time to keep the vision high. The data supports the notion. Cognitive conversations are getting higher. Meanwhile, running businesses is getting more complicated. So the more diverse views we have on things like ESG, climate change, et cetera, uh, I think the better chances of success in every way from profits on over. Right. So actually, my next question was about women empowerment uh, being a significant aspect of your work. And um, you've been involved in mentoring and training women entrepreneurs so what is the number one reason why women need to be lead- in leadership roles today? I think you've partially answered that question, but is there anything else you would like to add to that? Thank you. Um, let me just say that when you ask me that question, I contextualize it globally. I know a lot of our conversation is about the U.S., but when I think about that question, I think in global terms. So I hope that's right. okay. You know, that's perfect because that's what we want, actually. <laughs> Oh, great. Great. I've been so honored to work with um, hundreds of women around the world as founders. And so uh, I'll talk more about this at the end, but I just think there's so much to learn from one another. And the the number one reason that I do this before I answer your number one question is um, 
I think women, aside from the fact I am one, uh, women are really the key levers of uplifting societies. And we, so when we economically empower women, then we help them with their families. We help create mm -hmm. better societies, which as Pollyanna as it might sound from someone with, you know, a fairly sophisticated background, um, mm -hmm. I really think that's what leads to peace in the world. When people are have enough, or at least more to be yes. close to enough, um, that, you know, that mitigates an awful lot of problems. So I'm very excited because I love seeing people reach their personal potential or continue to try to reach their personal potential. But beyond that, I think there's very practical reasons. And one of them being more harmony in the planet, the more progress we can make. If we're spending all our time sending stuff back and forth, weapons, um, you know, it's not really going to make humanity progress. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree. So the number one thing you asked me, I'm sorry, can you ask that question again? The number one thing is... Uh, the one reason why women need to be in leadership roles today. Right. I did answer that in part. You're right. Um, because that will help more women get in leadership roles as more women. In, you know, it's a self-perpetuating kind of scenario. Right. I also think it's the key to... Um, Because again, I, I'm aware I sound kind of corny sometimes, but I think many of us women have been given really big gifts that we often don't get to use. So I think it's a double win. It's a, it's a win for more effective marketplaces, more effective workplaces, because we know now from the data that these, this cognitive diversity of not just women, but especially women, because that's where we're starting to unwrap the underrepresented furl, mm -hmm. um, adds to, to better profits, to better sustained, tur less turnover, all those good things. And it allows women to really fulfill themselves and become hopefully happier, healthier people. It's just such a win for everyone. Absolutely. You're right. You're right. So um, in your role as a trainer and a coach, what do you believe are the key challenges faced by women in leadership roles? And what specific leadership skills or qualities do you believe are essential for women leaders to acquire or develop? Well, how many hours was this interview going to be? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that there are quite a few. There are quite a few. And like I said, it's kind of an opportunity to leverage one's gifts as well. And I think many of these things really are for all leaders to develop. It's just that um, in some cases, because of a lack of exposure to the workplace until after children were well on their way or whatever, uh, it may take a little bit longer of an on-ramp for some women but i think for all leaders it's essential uh number one to have self-awareness i think it's critical um you know i used to think that leaders had to be perfect and i expected that of all my leaders my teachers my parents blah 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 and since i've embarked um you, you have mentioned that i have a leadership master's degree and a couple of credentials the more i learn about leadership which i see as a laboratory all the time Uh, the more I'm saying I'm sorry, <laughs> because it, you can't grow and be perfect. It's just not possible. And no one is born perfect. So right. I want to be the best leader I can be. And that means being aware of myself. Oh, that didn't work so well. This didn't work so well. Um, and in cultures working internationally, that really, that kind of constant, not, you know, not assessment to the point of analysis paralysis, as we say, but just checking in and making sure it's because what works in one culture very often does not work in another. And the same is true for individuals. Mm -hmm. You know, I was on a call like this yesterday and I frequently take um, shots while we're talking. I have today and we'll talk about that later. And um, those have been very popular on my social media, but this person really wasn't comfortable. She's used to working with just headshots in a very professional, formal manner. And she didn't want the publicity. So that was good for me to learn. I selected that I checked in with her first um, yeah, because good. here it's quite, you know, it's quite normal. But um, so it's always good to sort of check in and where, where are the values and being self-awareness is really, I think, based on one's awareness of one's values, what's important. Yeah. And that leads to another quality, which is integrity. Um, I think it's really important. It is for me as a hiring manager and in partnerships, please do what you say you're going to do. And if you're not going to do it or you can't do it, please tell me. <laughs> right. Absolutely. To me, that's, it's that simple. Um, it's amazing how hard that is to follow through sometimes. And, um, and I'm not saying it's easy, but I think to be a leader, you know, you really have, you have to, to, as we say, yeah. walk your talk. Hmm. You know? yeah. so the, and then I think you have to persist. 
Uh, and you have to be willing not to be liked. You have to decide, you know, kindness is very important, but that, you know, your job is not to be a friend. Your job is to lead. And so, yeah. um, and then the other thing I'll just say quickly, because women have been criticized on this, oh, I have a long list, but we'll, we'll end it with this one. All right. <laughs> um, ha having a vision. Um, this comes up. Uh, I'm honored to have a credential in the leadership practices inventory of um, Kuzis and Posner, and, and inspiring a shared vision is one of the key leadership attributes. It is the one that a groundbreaking at the time, 2008 Harvard study, found that women were the most, it's interesting, women were the most critiqued for not holding a vision very well. You know, very good doers, this was the, the connotation of the study, okay. very good doers, but not necessarily very inspirational or creating a clear shared vision. That was, you know, this is all, all what was it, 15 years ago or so. Um, so it's been a while and I've run some workshops on it. A couple of really stellar people have run workshops on it. And I know for myself, you know, as women, we are often programmed to take on our male partner's vision, right? We, My mother often spoke of achieving my father's dream. That mm. was the deal. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're sort of, and then there's the children. And so we're sort of ingrained from the beginning to subvert our vision to, to supporting other people's visions. So, um, but it's a powerful thing to claim when you can actually have an intention and a vision and, you know, this is really where business transformation comes from. Very true. Very true. That was a really good point. Um, so tell me, as a CEO and founder of the Newcom Global Group, what are some of your career goals now? Thank you. Well, I'm personally very interested in joining a private board. Uh, I've been honored to be on nonprofit boards for a long time. I've learned a lot, um, hopefully helped a lot and uh, some advisory boards, but I'm really ready to leverage the skills that I've learned from running an advisory services company to help in, um, with corporate governance at a private board level. So that's my next goal. Sounds good. Sounds really good. So thank you so much for being here, Lucy. That was really insightful. I'm really glad that you could make the time. All right. It's such a pleasure to speak with you. Thanks for what you're doing in Pakistan and for women around the world with these kinds of conversations. It's, you know, it's been a hard few years for women in particular. The pandemic was, I'm speaking grossly generally now, but the pandemic uh, here in the U.S. and I'm sure elsewhere was really hard on women, you know, having to teach kids at home and trying to do work from home and probably having one computer to do it all and, you know, still having to do the house stuff. And I mean, you know, it was really hard on women. That is Even really hard. stepping up. Yeah. Even with partners stepping up. But um, so in a way, I think a lot of us are kind of tired. But the opportunity now that the doors are opening again um, has never been greater. So let's have our best future pull us forward. Well said. Thank you so much for that, Lucy. Thank you so much for watching, guys. If you like this video or learned something from it, make sure to give us a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you next time. Bye bye.